dependence on Russian energy, the importance of denying Russia the ability to weaponize energy and to fund its war on Ukraine, examine the wartime and humanitarian implications of the fragile state of Ukraine's critical energy infrastructure, and offer recommendations for U.S. and allied, allied policy responses. Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022 exposed the dangers of the European Union's over-reliance on Russian oil and gas and sparked urgent debates about its need to diversify sources of energy, decarbonize its economies, while ensuring a just transition where all communities will benefit from reliable and affordable energy. In the years since, the EU states have bolstered their energy resilience by more closely partnering with the United States and others to increase their use of liquefied natural gas and renewables. However, the goal of denying Russia vast flows of oil and gas revenue to fund its war on Ukraine remains somewhat elusive. Member states have banned several Russian energy products and invested significantly in enhancing their energy independence. Uh, however, Russia continues to take in billions of dollars in oil revenue annually. After nearly three years of Russia's war of aggression, the energy situation in, in Ukraine is dire. Ukraine's ability to produce, store, and transmit power is severely impaired with far-reaching implications for the Ukrainian war effort and potentially disastrous consequences for the Ukrainian people. In order to defend its territory and to defeat Russia, it is imperative that Ukraine meet its significant and immediate energy needs while also defending and maintaining its energy infrastructure. To help us explore these issues, we will hear from three expert panelists. After brief introductions, they will have time to deliver remarks, and then we will have time for questions. Speaking first and on the geopolitics of European energy security, to include a nexus with China is Dr. Anna Mikulska. Dr. Mikulska is a research staff member at Science and Technology Policy Institute. She has a background in political science, international relations, and law. Prior to joining STPI, she was both a fellow in energy at Rice's University's Baker Institute, where she co-led the program on energy and geopolitics in Eurasia, and a senior fellow at the Kleinman Center for Energy Policy at the University of Pennsylvania. Her focus has been on markets for and geopolitics of energy, including the use of natural gas as a geo economic tool and the role of U.S. exports of liquefied natural gas in the context of domestic and international energy security. Dr. Mikulska's professional interests also include the impact of electoral politics on energy policy and international systems. She holds a doctorate in policy science from the University of Houston, a master's degree in international relations from the University of Windsor in Canada, and a law degree from Adam Miskiewicz University in Poland. Dr. Mikulska speaks Polish, English, German, Farsi, and Russian. Then we will hear from Dr. Joseph, Ma Joseph Maikut on the initiatives to build out Europe's existing critical energy infrastructure and how coordination among the EU, United States, and others can help curb Russian energy exports. Dr. Makut is Director of the Energy, and Se energy Security and Climate Change Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. In this role, Dr. Makut leads CSIS's work to understand the geopolitics of energy and climate change to ensure a global energy transition that is both responsive to the risks of climate change and the strategic and economic priorities of the United States and the world. Dr. Makut is an expert in climate science, climate policy, and in risk and uncertainty analysis for decision making. He is frequently cited in trade and national media on the politics of climate change and has testified before Congress on climate change and science. Before CSIS, Dr. Makut worked as the Director of Climate Policy at the Niskansen, Nikanden, excuse me, Nick Cannon Center where he led efforts to research and promote carbon pricing, low carbon and innovation, regulatory reform, and other market reforms to speed decarbonization. Between 2014 and 2015, he worked in the U.S. Senate as a Congressional Science Fellow, supported by the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Geosciences Institute. He holds a Ph.D. from Princeton University in Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, a Master's Degree in Applied Mathematics from the Delft University of Technology, and a Bachelor's Degree in Mathematics from Harvey Mudd College. And finally, Ms. Olga Kokova will offer insights into the current state of Ukraine's energy infrastructure and offer recommendations on how the United States and allies can partner with Ukraine to foster innovation and resilience. Ms. Kokovka is Deputy Director for European Energy Security at the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center. Ms. Kokovka leads GEC's portfolio on advancing energy security, decarbonization, and competitiveness through cooperation between the United States and Europe. She addresses these issues through in-depth research and high-level convenings. 
Ms. Kokova frequently appears on the BBC, Bloomsburg, CNN, Deutsche Welle, NPR, and Times Radio as a guest commentator. Her work has been published in Barron's, The Economist, Foreign Policy, The New York Times, The National Journal, Politico, and The Washington Post. Before joining the Atlantic Council, Ms. Kokova was a senior program coordinator for the U.S. Energy Association's Energy Technology and Governance Program and a program director for the Climate Plus Energy Project, a clean energy nonprofit in the Midwest. Dr. Mikulska, you have the floor. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm really uh, happy to be here and have the opportunity to revisit what I've been looking at for years now, uh, even before Russia invaded um, Ukraine. Uh, that invasion and events that follow have exposed serious deficiencies in energy security of the European Union and its members. As I have testified a year and a half ago to the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources for the hearing that examined the impact, impact of the invasion on European and global energy security, Europe failed on all aspects of energy security and, and sec security of supply as defined by its availability, accessibility, affordability, and acceptability. Those deficiencies in energy security were tied directly to EU's over-dependence on Russian energy supply and Russia's willingness to use that supply to exert geopolitical pressure. Natural gas has been the most geopolitically sensitive of the fuels due to the need for extensive infrastructure to move its volumes, either by, via pipelines or as liquefied natural gas import and, uh, through import and export terminals. Russia has known it all too well and has been manipulating supplies to Europe since the winter before the invasion. Ever since, the growth in LNG trade and buildup of LNG infrastructure in Europe has helped in addressing some of the deficiencies. However, the supply that still does not match the potential demand needed to avoid energy crisis anywhere in the world in case of major supply disruption or if demand increases based on weather. The supply of LNG globally has been steadily increasing with the US as a major player. This is important since the US LNG volumes are flexible in terms of destination and, hand ca ca and that's, that's how they can help balance global markets. With no destination clause, any buyer of US LNG can send the fuel anywhere in the world. Oftentimes, the supply goes to whoever can pay the highest price. Since the Russian invasion on Ukraine, Europe has been usually the highest bidder. High prices of energy in Europe have contributed to increase in energy efficiency and strong development of renewables. However, high prices have also contributed to inflationary pressure and decrease in industrial activity and investment. The latter is particularly true to, for hard to abate sectors, such as steel, cement, and glass manufacturing or fertilizer industry where, gas, natu where natural gas is used. Renewable power has been often seen as more secure in terms of supply, given that it's generated domestically. However, because of its intermittent nature, it cannot yet support the energy system in the same way that traditional energy generation or electricity generation does. In addition, there's the concern of becoming dependent on China for critical minerals and air, rare earth supply needed for renewable generation. Natural gas, on the other hand, is seen as a good backup for intermittent renewables as it's less emission intensive than coal and its generation is flexible. It can be switched on and off relatively quickly to assist the grid. This natural gas will continue to be an important fuel for Europe. Still, relatively large share of natural gas that Europe consumes comes from Russia. For some countries, especially Austria, Slovakia, and Hungary, Russian gas still comprises majority of natural gas flows via pipeline. Russian pipeline gas supply, especially to those countries, is likely to decrease when Ukraine-Russia transit contract concludes end of this year. This will make even more critical the supply of LNG that reaches Europe. Paradoxically, Russian LNG imports into Europe have been increasing. In fact, they are increasing at the time when all other LNG supplies are decreasing. Given high prices of natural gas, the revenues that Russia state, state garners from those sales are contributing to Russian economy and its ability to wage war. A recent report by EIA has notably pointed out that Russian gas production has increased 9% year on year 
in the first three quarters of 2024. Similarly, revenues from oil, uh, from sales of oil support Russian state as Russia is able to exploit lack of universal adherence to sanctions as well as the loopholes in those sanctions. Russian oil not only flows via pipeline to some of the EU states, it also is blended into oil coming from other origins and it's sold either directly or indirectly as refined in other product. The latter is not subject to sanctions. In the meantime, China has become Russia's main energy export destination, particularly for natural gas, which Russia is sending there via pipeline of power of Siberia, one, and as LNG. With lack of other markets, Russia is becoming dependent on China as a demand center. Those closer ties between Russia and China could become problematic in general as well as with, the respect, uh, with respect to energy flows. After all, both countries combine the powers of world's major fuel supplier and world's largest energy consumer. This creates potential for geopolitical in interference. Thank you. Thank you so much. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, everybody, for having us today. Pleasure to be here with my esteemed colleagues, um, noting, of course, that these comments reflect my own opinions, not those of my employer. Um, it's now well known the energy crisis, kicked off by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, reshaped global energy markets, and placed Europe on a new energy trajectory. There's three things I want to highlight for the, um, for the group today that we've learned from that and are going to affect decision making going forward. First, Europe managed the loss of uh, Russian gas through a combination of LNG imports, demand reduction, and the acceleration of renewable energy. Oftentimes we miss the latter two um, uh, factors in that story from the United States perspective. Second, the financial and infrastructure challenges that that transition brought still need resolution today. And finally, there remains, there remains to be the need for the U.S. to craft a long-term strategy to address Russia's role in global energy markets to achieve um, uh, long-term lasting support for Ukraine as well as uh, larger geopolitical aims. Um, a lot of my comments today are based on a report that we published earlier this year. The title Power Plays, Europe's Response to the Energy Crisis. It's in the materials we shared, and um, I brought one copy in case anybody is hyper-interested. Um, <clears throat> when Russia weaponized its energy exports following the invasion of Ukraine, Europe was forced into an unprecedented test of energy resilience. The scaling here actually matters. Russian fossil fuels made up one-fifth of the EU's, ener EU's energy consumption and quickly dindled to just now 5% in a matter of a couple of years. That's a really large shock to a, what usually are relatively stiff systems. Um, a critical part, as we just heard and, and I think is becoming more and more well known, is, was that Europe's survival strategy involved ramping up natural gas imports, particularly LNG from the United States. Uh, between 2021 and 2022, European imports of U.S. LNG doubled, rising from about 30 to 70 billion cubic meters in each year, and um, most of that coming from Europe. And n Europe is now also the primary market for U.S. LNG exports, so the, the, the integration is, is quite large on either side. Uh, buying such large quantities of LNG from global markets required European buyers to pay high prices, peaking in summer 22, but those have now uh, settled to about double pre-crisis levels. At the same time, Europe, I think, made significant strides in renewable energy. And wind and solar projects were expanded dramatically. There were changes to permitting re regimes. And that demonstrated that energy transition really can support energy security for energy importing uh, countries. While Europe, while Europe already had significant renewable generation pre-crisis, the expansion, particularly in solar, uh, deserves note. Uh, renewable capacity also adds up year over year as well. For the two years of this energy crisis, Europe added about 3% of its generation needs in solar each year. Um, as that capacity builds, that's expected to reduce the need for gas and coal and power generation going forward. The combination of quick action on LNG imports and the expansion of renewables helped Europe weather the storm and keep the lights on, but that came at a significant cost. The rapid transition away from Russian energy imports cost Europe dearly. The fiscal outlay to shield consumers and firms from the rise in energy prices amounted to $650 billion approximately by mid-2023. Across different European countries, this spending ranged from 1% to 7% of gross domestic product. This is U.S. Department of Defense levels of spending. Um, and that's absolutely unsustainable in the long term. Um, the costs of Europe and energy, which are still, again, twice those in the United States, were recently highlighted in Mario Draghi's report, The Future of European Competitiveness, as a threat to industrial comp 
competitiveness in Europe. Um, and to address this, the report cited, and I think this is kind of now emerging consensus, Europe will have to invest further in additional infrastructure that will enable decarbonization and reduce energy costs by improving security. Uh, indeed, we now see a lot of that investment happening. New natural gas infrastructure will meaningfully move European countries off of Russian imports for good. For example, the vert vertical corridor pipeline project in the eastern, southeastern part of Europe is going to link gas systems from Greece to Ukraine and will really help, particularly in the case of Moldova and Ukraine, um, get off uh, Russian gas imports. Um, likewise, the Adriatica pipeline in, in southern Italy will connect points from North Africa to points beyond in Europe. Um, and the Baltic pipeline connected Poland to Norway and was turned on, I think, very closely to the uh, explosion of Nord Stream 2. Um, the, the point is, like, a lot of that, I think, is actually happening. The infrastructure necessary to secure long-term energy supplies is being built. Um, likewise, as those renewables are deployed, we're going to see uh, a need for interconnection and transmission infrastructure similar to the one we're seeing here in the United States. Europe's pursuing expanded transmission capacity with projects like the Biscay Gulf interconnection linking Spain and France, the New Connect project linking the UK and Germany. Uh, I'll note that even more than pipelines, these international connectors actually require a great deal of trust between the countries on either side. Um, because they link to the electricity system on either side, and those things seem to be in constant balance. And so the, the geopolitics of large-scale and electricity transition actually introduce new dependencies for Europeans that um, we might not, that are still being sort of probed and, and well, need to be well understood. Um, lastly, as Europe managed its transition away from Russian energy, uh, Putin's cronies looked elsewhere to sell their stuff. Um, Russian energy is not disappearing entirely from global markets. Russian liquefied natural gas still finds buyers, and the country continues to use uh, oil exports as a source of revenue for domestic and war spending. Russia forecasts that its energy export revenues will indeed increase in 2024, despite the imposition of sanctions, import bans, and the U.S.-led oil price cap on, on oil exports. The latter of those, I would like to comment on briefly, designed to reduce Russian oil export revenue without spiking global prices. The, the, we, we now see that this price cap is leaking. A colleagues from CSIS recently wrote, and I quote, overall embargoes and price caps have only had a modest impact on Russian state finances. Russia's export volumes have held up thanks to its shadow tanker fleet, and despite crackdowns and pressure on dodgy traders, it's been hard to control activities in dark corners of the oil market that enable Russian export. The reality is, end quote, the reality is that demand for energy products combined with sophisticated markets means that energy has to, will find ways into global marketplaces. More effective enforcement may help, but the U.S. needs to think strategically about how to contain Russia's influence over global energy markets while providing alternatives for energy importing countries like those in Europe. That means focusing on developing clean energy economies around the world and allowing U.S. export volumes of oil and gas to contribute to well-supplied and less volatile energy markets globally. Um, I'm going to end my comments there. Thank you very much. Look forward to the discussion. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. And before I pass the floor, I just want to do a little point of order. When, after we hear um, Ms. Kokoko's uh, statement, then we will um, have a microphone available. We invite you to think of questions and take advantage of the fact that you were in the presence of experts who think about these uh, very important and complex things all the time. I'll take a couple questions from the floor, and then we will revert to the panel. We'll have, hopefully, we'll have a, a very uh, strong exchange. And with that, I pass the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation, and it's really an honor to be here and join this briefing. Yesterday, October 15th, uh, was the start of the heating season in Ukraine, and possibly the beginning of the most brutal winter since the onset of the full-scale invasion. Ukraine could face a supply deficit that's equal to a third of its peak demand following Russia's decimation of around 11 gigawatts of power. But with the right coordination and preparation across the transatlantic allies, this worst case scenario can and must be avoided. Such actions are also essential for protecting and securing European energy security as well. Today also marks the 964th day of this horrific legal invasion. We're coming up to 1,000 days of this assault. Putin's failure to win the war on the battlefield has evolved into this heinous strategy of making Ukraine's bustling, thriving cities unlivable. 
He plans to accomplish this by taking out critical energy infrastructure, electricity, water, heating, and communication services. Despite Moscow's efforts, though, Ukrainians stayed brave, resilient, and unbroken during this challenging time, of course, with help from allies, including Europe, United States, and others around the globe and their generosity. But 25 major attacks have been recorded over the two years, specifically on the energy sector. Um, this assault has progressively intensified some in March, those who have been following this, especially this summer, leaving millions of civilians without power. Blackouts ranging from a couple of hours, at the very best, to 14 to 16 hours a day. Families are raising children, managing to work, complete their work assignments, cooking, taking care of their sick and elderly with just a couple of hours of electricity a day. Imagine that. But there's a bit of good news too. It's all not doom and gloom. Thanks to the agile and generous responses to, uh, from Ukraine's allies and bravery of the energy sector workers and the leadership in Ukraine, the country is now finally getting a temporary reprieve from the loss of power. But the situation is extremely fragile. Uh, the past patterns of attack, of attacks on Ukraine's energy sector strongly suggest that Russia is stockpiling for another mass offensive to launch Ukraine into freezing darkness this winter, particularly by severing connections to the three remaining operational nuclear power plants and very likely intensifying attacks on some of the heating systems. Such scenarios go beyond the humanitarian disaster for Ukraine that would be expected if Russia succeeds. It's also an economic and energy security issue for Europe, but also United States. Strong, secure Europe, a strong, massive trade partner for US, that is a benefit for a transatlantic relationship that is a benefit for United States. Ukraine's energy security is a win for US, is a win for European energy markets as well. And as my previous um, uh, panelists and speakers have mentioned rightfully so, uh, you know, U European energy systems are deeply interconnected. It must not, they don't exist in a vacuum and they might not, must not be treated as in a vacuum. U European integration of its energy markets with Ukraine including is part of its strength. It's what keeps U European markets competitive. But we, that also means that we need to protect all aspects of European energy security, including Ukraine. Now, what makes this situation particularly challenging are a couple of external factors um, that could put further pressure and additional demand on the system. For example, cold snaps, you know, really severe winter, potential technical issues and outages, the insufficient maintenance that did not take place, that should have taken place because Russia has destroyed so much of the infrastructure, regular maintenance could not happen. That could also exacerbate the problems. And of course, the risks of cybersecurity attacks, not just for Ukraine, but Europe and United States as well. Um, for Ukraine, the frequency of those cybersecurity attacks have tripled since the beginning, of the full-scale invasion. But again, some, you know, serious, it's a horrific situation, but some good news and hope. Um, to, you know, together with allies, you can't, Ukraine can prepare for Russia's malign actions. We know what to expect. And also some of these additional external scenarios that are really hard to control or we have absolutely no control over in terms of the extreme weather events that are on the horizon that could impact the demand. I'm going to outline just a couple of specific opportunities because yes, I wanted to present how dire the situation is. I also wanted to showcase how Ukraine was able to maintain its energy production, even in this horrific environment, but also being realistic about what's on the horizon. And here are a couple of suggested action items that can ensure that Ukraine survives this winter and thrives not just this winter, but in the long term. So kind of in the first broader category, um, just thinking through protection of the you know, remaining infrastructure, the most efficient way for, to protect the energy sector is preventing the damage in the first place. 
providing Ukraine with sufficient air defense to protect remaining critical infrastructure, such as the three nuclear power plants and the networks that are interconnected that are near these power plants, would save billions of dollars of reconstruction, rebuilding, and other costs down the road. This is the baseline. Um, Ukraine has also demonstrated innova incredible innovation uh, in fortification and concealment of smaller scale components of the energy system, you know, hard shell defense for smaller infrastructure, something that's not possible for the really large centralized power plants. Scaling this type of smaller protection um, is also really important, and with the help of allies, Ukraine can do this across multiple parts of the system. The decentralization of Ukraine's energy system is another key pillar and another pathway for Ukraine to create a resilient strategy to protect its energy sector. How so? So distributed energy systems are much more challenging to destroy for Russia or other malign players versus something that's more centralized. Advancing decentralization at scale will require public-private partnerships, which can be enabled through the risking mechanisms. Um, DFC can play a key role, and they have played a key role in providing some of those very creative mechanisms. They have contributed significant amounts of money. Uh, but again, thinking through on how to drive additional private sector investments, showcasing and supporting specific projects to showcase that there is a way to do this, even in this challenging environment in Ukraine, there's a way to mitigate risk, uh, to work with partners, to be creative. Ukraine is not a monolith. Certain projects closer to the front lines carry higher risks versus in some other parts. And again, protection from cybersecurity attacks, extremely important. It's vital, just as vital as kinetic defense. Allies should support Ukraine uh, in its already very successful efforts, incredible rate of success, uh, in reinforcing what I call the cybersecurity shield, if you would. Um, now, talking through on how to make sure that the right deliveries get to Ukraine on time. Uh, one of the issues is funding, unfortunately. Um, it remains key. But Ukraine's Energy Support Fund um, has been successfully run by the, by the Energy Community Secretariat and has been an exceptionally effective way to garner and channel funding for meeting the most urgent needs in Ukraine's energy sector, procuring equipment as well as spare parts, technical items, different fuels needed to repair infrastructure and maintain heat supply in Ukraine. Um, the fund has received some uh, uh, additional funding from Germany, from the EU. So it's really important that this fund continues to stay full so that way, especially ahead of this winter, that there's a lot, there's sufficient money there to ensure that procurement can continue smoothly and it doesn't become depleted when Ukraine needs access to this money to repair, replenish, and procure the right parts for its energy system. Uh, moreover, Ukraine and its allies uh, achieved significant progress on expediting uh, the right equipment deliveries to the right locations across Ukraine. Uh, if, you know, those of you, I'm sure all of you have seen Ukraine on the map. It's, it's a, you know, it's huge. And making sure that the right communities get the right parts that are, you know, have unique specs is really, really important as quickly as possible. Um, by building out relationships with communities on the front lines, especially donors in different countries or multilateral donors can better understand the unique needs of the different communities in Ukraine. For example, you know, this uh, combined heat and power units, getting them to the right locations as quickly as possible, uh, making sure there's reliable backup options, including liquefied petroleum gas, LPG heaters, wood stoves and other solutions. There has been progress made, and this has expedited how quickly deliveries come to Ukraine to the right places, but there's still room to grow. And then finally, repairing, rebuilding, and replacing re equipment. So ramping up production of critical energy equipment in Europe and United States would create a much needed strategic reserve of crucial system equipment. So thinking through it in a more holistic way, not just for Ukraine, but for all of the transatlantic energy systems. This will address a broader transatlantic strategy component shortage on our hands today uh, that we're facing, not just in Ukraine, but in Europe, in the United States. Um, one example, Ukrainego, Ukraine's uh, energy system operator, is making good progress on, in accumula accumulating a stock repair equipment. So they're accumulated three times of what's usually needed. Um, 
And, but these are unprecedented times. Three times might not even be enough. So really going on the extremes and, and preparing for the worst. Um, another strategy is optimizing exports from Europe. Imports, excuse me, uh, optimizing electricity imports from Europe, uh, which will, of course, reduce the need and the pressure to produce more energy at home. Uh, before the full-scale invasion, um, it, even at times during the last last couple of year and a half, two years and a half, Ukraine has securely exported power to neighboring European nations. Incredible! In the midst of the war, now imports from Europe will play a crucial role in keeping the lights on, anticipating about 1.7 gigawatts of electricity to be uh, imported from Europe by Ukraine this, um, in the near future. Expanding this interconnections with Europe, and especially Moldova, and securing also Moldova's energy system because of how closely it's intertwined, a very key strategy here. And I spoke a little bit about risking investments, so just kind of driving that point home. Um, again, finding ways to encourage private sector engagement in Ukraine. I'll give you one example. Um, Ukraine has massive gas storage capacity, and it has been utilized by traders even during the full-scale invasion without any kind of de-risking or insurance. But Russia noticed that and attacked its facilities uh, to not, n none of their success. They kept the gas flowing safe. They, they were able to deliver the gas. Um, but Russia did this to discourage Europe and European traders from storing their gas in Ukraine's vast natural gas facilities into the future. But the resilience of these facilities has been clearly demonstrated, and Europe should offer, and US should offer de risking mechanisms to encourage future traders, European uh, private sector companies, and others to store gas in, in Ukraine. This, is also, this also has positive economic implications for Ukraine as well. And finally, just a couple of last points. The occupied territories must not be forgotten. For example, international communities must prioritize efforts to prevent a nuclear disaster in occupied Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Multiple safety violations and near misses have been recorded to date near this plant, signaling and at the plant, signaling that an incident is of high probability and it's just a matter of time. It's not if, it's when. The control of the plant must be given back to Ukraine in the best case scenario. At the very least, it must be given to someone who, to non-Russian forces to ensure the safety, you know, whether it's a neutral party, but we do need to pay more attention to what's happening in Zaporizhia even if it's giving control to more of a neutral party, even if it's not, at the very worst case, not Ukrainians operating it. With Russians operating it and occupying it, we're just watching a slow, slow motion of a disaster on the horizon. And to finish a bit of a more you know, positive note, look, Ukraine is in a challenging situation right now, but it must not be viewed as a victim. It should be viewed as a partner in Europe, a partner who can help Europe build a, a low carbon, resilient, secure energy system. Uh, the country is a source of best practices for resilience and recovery, decentralization, and cybersecurity defense. And as Europe and US face you know, unique challenges at home that are, of course, different from what's going on in Ukraine, uh, but you know, seeing what's happening with the hurricanes and other threats to the energy system, even cybersecurity threats, are, there are a lot of similarities. We can take those skills and we can take best practices and utilize those skills. Um, this will be extremely helpful. We're at an inflection point right now about Ukraine's energy future, and we know what the risks are. Russia has shown its true colors, its face, its, what it's capable of. We know what the threats are. We know exactly what to do to prevent them, to mitigate them, to make sure that Ukraine, as I mentioned earlier, can be a thriving hub for innovation, clean en and low carbon energy production, can support European energy security. But first, it must survive this winter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to each of our panelists. Um, there's been some reports that have additionally been mentioned in some of the comments. Um, those will be posted to our website with uh, the testimonies that you've given um, shortly so everyone can um, be able to follow uh, along and be able to look up that additional information. 
Um, we heard um, we're going to have a staff person here with a microphone. So um, if you would like to prepare your questions, um, someone will be right. Thank you so much. Someone will be right with you. Um, we heard a lot about the costs and interconnectivity and the dire condition under which uh, Ukrainians are living, but also the uh, two times the energy costs that our European friends and allies are living with, and the the real geopolitical crisis that Russia's full-scale invasion has precipitated, um, exposing all these weaknesses in Europe's over-reliance on gas and how to move to not only a more sustainable future, but certainly a, a one that is less invested in helping Russia to fund its war against Ukraine. Um, with that, I pause a minute and then I'll turn it to the floor. So if anybody would like her to take questions, we'll probably get one or two, and then we can turn it back to our panelists for some discussion. Please. We just, yes, he's bringing it over. Please, I'll turn off the microphone here. Look at this, this is great. All right, look at that. Now I feel very improvised. Yeah, I'm Paul Massaro, I'm the staff director of the Helsinki Commission. My question's for Dr. Mishkud. Um, Sorry, but last name, it's wrong. But um, <clears throat> you mentioned the, you know, the U.S. sanctions, and I guess really the coalition sanctions on Russian energy. Um, you know, I mean, we've tried to run these to ground on multiple occasions, trying to understand w sort of what's happened here, because, uh, I mean, certainly by the metrics, they seem to have essentially failed. I mean, if our mission was to bankrupt Russia, we haven't. <laughs> but by any stretch of the imagination, we haven't. Um, and I guess the question is, <clears throat> is the design flawed? Was it, was it not gonna happen to begin with? I mean, you know, I mean, there's, there's been this thinking of, well, we're, we're trying to get Russia actually to sell as much as possible at the lowest price possible, and we're gonna, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, just when I, when I hear even myself say that, it's kind of like, really, that was our goal? Uh, I mean, so it's, it, 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 you know, I, I guess I, you know, you'd, you'd mentioned, I think, what is told, has been told over and over and over again, which is we've tried to balance stability in global markets with um, bankrupting Russia. <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, it seems like we've, we've either m m misunderstood this or wildly prioritized stability in global markets to the point that, I mean, Russia doesn't seem to have even taken much of a hit. I mean, if I'm wrong, I'd like to know. So, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, it, altering oil markets is a tricky thing to do because as a commodity, oil is very fluidly, pun intended, exchanged, <laughs> right? And while I think there there is plenty of evidence that early on the price uh, cap or, or other sanctions did have an effect on Russian oil export revenues. They just the industry has found ways around that. Like Russian exporters have created a shadow fleet. It's like ships that don't work through the insurance, the standard insurance programs and other things. Um, and that is going to be part of the reality. So what do we that, like? That is the reality of how this has worked. So what do we do? One, we we can work around the edges to make it work a little better. Right, you could you could look at higher levels of insurance um, uh, requirements and verification at critical shipping points. Right, Turkey tried to do this, and then favoring global market stability, we said, well, maybe we can be a little bit more lax. So, like as we look to for options to kind of create additional pressure now, that's that's one option. Um, uh, I can send you uh, the fall, you know, piece that we wrote that has uh, a couple others, but the reality is like market demand will be met. And so when we think about what a longer term strategy is going to be, it's probably finding other suppliers or reducing global demand so that we can create additional pressure on Russian exports without causing undue economic harm elsewhere. And that's why like fluid US oil exports are, are uh, helpful. If OPEC or, or Saudi Arabia decides to increase supply, um, to to that you know that would that would actually like potentially reduce prices and and cause trouble for Russia's war economy, but it really it, we do it's it at some point we need to have uh, some sort of view on what we want the like the global supply balance to look like and how we're going to manage that over the long term. 
please do. And if you'd kindly state your name and your affiliation before you speak, thank you. Thank you all for sharing your expertise today. My name is Isabella Baker, I'm with the CSCE. A few other countries have mentioned this discussion, Moldova particularly, Turkey more recently. I'm curious what efforts have been made or what efforts can be facilitated as to regional energy security in the Black Sea region in Ukrainian's neighborhood. Well, I think there have been already efforts that, have, uh, that are important and that uh, includes the LNG terminals that have started uh, to function in southern Europe. Right? So these ones are important for the uh, security of supply in, 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 the, in southern Europe, um, in especially the Greek terminal, I think, for Moldova might be important, um, as, as I think um, um, Joseph mentioned before. Uh, for Turkey, it's a little bit more complicated. I don't think Turkey has an issue with security of supply. In fact, it's been uh, developing a system within which it becomes almost a place where the supply ends up being delivered and then distributed, it's sort of a hub, and that includes supply from Russia. Right. So there has been a recent even announcement that potentially uh, at uh, Botas, the Turkish state company, will start mixing uh, oil. Uh, its oil have a new blend, Turkish blend, which will include up to 40 percent of Gazprom's uh, uh, of, 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 of Russian. Um, sorry, this was gas of, of gas and uh, uh, mixed with Gazprom, Gazprom's gas. So that's uh, that's something that uh, Turkey has been actually. The, in many ways using to increase its ability to uh, be the reg regional gas hub um, and uh, potentially uh, profit both politically, but also uh, one could think of geopolitical profits that Turkey could um, uh, basically have being in that situation between both worlds. This also speaks to the need for Europe and EU specifically to have a broader enforceable strategy about the future of Russia's LNG and natural gas. Uh, right now, the gas that's not going uh, to Europe, the, re the reason for reductions is Russia. Putin was the one who stopped the exports, not European sanctions or laws. Uh, right now, there are some restrictions on being able to do tr transshipments for LNG, but overall, LNG and gas and piped gas can come legally into Europe. There is no enforceable date. There is no enforceable deadline for, to, for phasing those out. So if Europe and EU specifically is serious about clarity, to creating transparency, what's coming through Turkey, what's coming through Azerbaijan and other Central Asian countries to Europe, there needs to be a clear timeline to say, by this date, this is how much we want to see or not see some of the pipe gas. This is what we want to see on Russian LNG. Uh, this strategy right now does not exist, which makes it more confusing for private sector investors to figure out how they can play into the European market if they don't know that there's a certain phase-out date deadline uh, for Europe and Russian gas relationship. Perhaps I can use my uh, privileged position as the moderator to ask a question or to myself. Um, one of the, the conditions of being able to try to um, make European energy more secure and more resilient um, is obviously a shift away from carbon in general or ru Russian gas in particular. Um, but one of the things that um, you mentioned, uh, Ms. Kokovka, is the decentralization mm -hmm. and um, kind of uh, hubs and smaller mm -hmm. uh, systems making the, si the system itself by design, infrastructurally speaking, more resilient. Um, where are, um, is European thinking in terms of this ability to look at building out infrastructure in that way? and? Uh, also, the ability to um, of our European friends, if, if you could project um, to um, let's say sustain the kind of increases in prices as they have as they figure out this transition. Will the transition come in whatever form it comes 
um, quickly enough to be able to um, meet the public's expectations and as well as their energy security needs. Perhaps I'll start with you. Thank you. Sure, and you've hit on something that's exactly the answer here too is the reason for Ukraine's uh, decentralization versus in Europe. You know, in Europe, yes, it's energy security is important um, aspect of decentralization, but it's decentralization in Europe broadly is driven by the need to decarbonize mm -hmm. um, while trying to do that competitively. Uh, while in Ukraine, it's very much driven by how do we physically, physically, you know, secure our energy sector. Now, I think in the future, if you know Europe can build out a system that's both, that's the end goal. But even in peaceful times, even in Europe, that's not uh, in the broader European in EU, that's not being bombed every day. It is, it is a challenging, in any United States, it is a challenging task in peaceful times to decentralize a massive system. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've heard energy experts refer to, to this, this is such a great uh, comparison, of you know, trying to build out a multi -high, smaller highway road system while you're still using the main highway and then somehow encouraging you know, the cars to kind of rear off. And I mean, it is extremely complex, mm -hmm. but there is a way to do it uh, with the right strategies um, and the right upgrades to the grid, the right built out mm -hmm. of the grid. Um, but it's a lot of financing, it's a lot of money. The, the Draghi report was mentioned a few times, and I think we can all agree that it's the financing gap that's, that's really a massive, you know, a massive concern. Mm -hmm. And part of that financing is building out the energy infrastructure that's gonna take us mm -hmm. to the decentralized systems that we want to see in Ukraine and across Europe. Okay. If I can add, um, I think it's, it's, it's actually a really, a really great point. And uh, one thing that Europe is doing is it's developing its renewables, which are much more decentralized or can be decentralized. The other part is SMR, so small modular nuclear reactors, right? That we, we're thinking about as part of the decentralizing potentially if once they get employed in Europe or otherwise. Uh, but that's something that we, we, we're trying to figure out. Uh, what I wanted to underscore is um, something we've talked about when I was still at the Baker Institute, and uh, we were talking about how, what is energy security, right? And energy security, we were talking about how, import, how important it is to decentralize and also diversify a supply. However, what actually decarbonization does, it does the opposite. Uh, it actually puts everything into a grid into electricity, exactly directly opposite to diversifying uh, as the electricity reaches the, uh, the, the demand points. Yes, there's some diversification in terms of the generation, but at the end, everything is in a system that could be attacked, both physically, but also as a, uh, in the, um, as, uh, through cyber attacks. And that's when the decentralization might be extremely important to, to achieve. So once the system is attacked, it doesn't necessarily roll through different countries because as, as, as Joseph has mentioned, those countries are in Europe in particular are becoming increasingly interconnected with respect to electricity. Right. Yeah, I'll just, I, maybe I kind of take a step back, right? Like Europe was already aiming to do a relatively rapid transition away from fossil fuel use. Um, you know, like there was, there was some kind of sense and a lot of public rhetoric, right, this emergency happened, like, well, now they're gonna change all the, you know, get rid of those unrealistic plans. No, like Europe now is, the prices are incentivizing transition in a way that they didn't necessarily before. Um, we, the tasks ahead are relatively straightforward, they're not necessarily easy, right? Building enough interconnection that you can build a high renewable system, finding a way to do storage to mat, to, deal with like daily or weekly or monthly shortfalls in generation. Um, the European Union is like slightly different from the US where when we build electricity transmission, we want it to go east to west, they want it to go north to south because there's a lot, of, it's very sunny in the Mediterranean, it's very windy in the north and finding, and those two can kind of help balance each other um, over, over a long time. Now, um, what, what can the US do? The US can definitely help by you know, investing in technology and sharing the technology, the learnings that we do, whether it's small modular reactors, whether it's like digital services, um, you know, demand, re demand reduction techniques, like th those are all things that are relatively shareable between developed economies. There's some role for the state in helping enable that, but, it, but it's, you know, largely the U.S. letting our firms innovate and take their innovations abroad. The other thing we can do is, is uh, you know, make sure that we are 
providing adequate energy supply to the extent we can, whether that's continuing to export LNG, supply oil to global markets. There's a future role for hydrogen that the Europeans see as a big part of their energy security strategy. Um, to the extent the U.S. is going to be a, or a maker or a supplier of those of that hydrogen, we, sh we should work together to make sure whatever we're producing meets the environmental and, and other standards that are going to be set in Europe and are, and are part of their energy security story. I don't mean to, to hog the mic. I just... Uh... You said the magic words, the magic letters, which is SMRs. So I'm just wondering. I, got, I actually have two, two, two quick things. And the first is, are SMRs real? Because <laughs> they constantly get brought up as some kind of miracle solution. And I've never seen one. And I mean, they always just seem like fantasy technology to me. Um, or else like right on the precipice, but never quite there sort of things. Um, and then the second thing, I guess, because we were talking about the decarbonization thing, I sort of take exception with the idea that Europe was, they were saying they were decarbonizing, sure. <laughs> but I mean, Germany shut down its nuclear power plants. <laughs> you know, I mean, nuclear is like zero carbon technology. You know, the, the idea here was to buy a huge amount of cheap Russian gas, um, you know, to, to basically, you know, run the system off purchasing from <laughs> corrupt gas from Russia. And when that was no longer an option, they went back to coal. <laughs> I, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, these aren't, these aren't exactly like low carbon, <laughs> you know, fuels. So, so I mean, I, I guess it's confusing to me to, to, to hear like, oh, they're, they're, they're heading this way or, or they were doing it anyway or something like this. But it, like, because to me, it's like, actually, if they were serious about this, they would have been investing in nuclear a long time ago, when the only one that did was France, which did it not out of decarbonization reasons, but out of energy independence, you know, great France sort of reasons, which, you know, were, were different than all this other kind of stuff. So, I mean, is, is Germany now going to re-embrace nuclearization? Is nuclear going to come back? Or, because, I mean, you, you make that face, but I mean, I, I mean, are, are we serious about this or not? I mean, it's just, it's, there just feels like this almost like foundational silliness to this that we've got the the Greens in government burning lignite and coal. Well, there's a lot there. Um, does someone <laughs> want to start with this? I mentioned that SMRs. Please. Honestly, I'm, <laughs> I'll go ahead. We're, we're, we're delighted um, you did. Please. Take. I think there is there is something to it. Although yes, in, indeed the SMRs are kind of still always like a one step behind uh, of what we are hoping. Um, I believe there is one SMR working or close to working in China. Uh, so there. Uh, uh, I, 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 again, please do not quote me on this, but there are some, uh, so, there is some movement, right, uh, uh, on the horizon, I believe. Uh, however, when it comes to the clean energy, uh, decarbonization of energy in Europe, I think there is a lot to it, and particularly in Germany, I think, um, I think there was this kind of idea, well, let's run on cheap Russian gas until we can actually really decarbonize through renewables based on some type of technological breakthrough that we're going to have. For sure, we're gonna have right, and but until then, let's 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 run it uh, directly from Russia under the Baltic Sea, and, and you know, and 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 uh, and, uh, and get that uh, get that gas in a cheap way. Exploit Russia because Russia it will depend on us. Uh, little did they know, Russia fought the opposite, uh, right, and Russia was able to actually call the bluff. Uh, in many ways, by cutting, as, as Olga has mentioned, by cutting supply to Europe. Uh, Europe has not cut supply from Russia, I mean, uh, it's the opposite, exact opposite. So um, in terms of nuclear power, and I've looked at it at some point in, in, in Germany, um, there has been the movement against nuclear uh, through actually greens that's been happening in Germany since, since 1970s. It's much, much deeper than, uh, than, than we can think of within the last three, four years or so. Um, it's been uh, underscored by the Chernobyl, uh, you know, um, disaster, and 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 later on, 
uh, going forward. Access to gas kind of allowed Germany to think outside the box of the nuclear box. And, and that's kind of what they, the, it, it actually, the nuclear uh, um, was, uh, uh, was taken out by law. In fact, Germany has extended its nuclear power plants uh, uh, by four months till Till April of uh, till April, even though it was supposed to shut it down in December, based on the energy security consideration as a backup power. <laughs> Interestingly enough, which is nuclear is known not really for a backup ability, right? But it has extended and then it shut it down. It's unclear whether or not Germany had actually uh, fuel to be able to keep those power plants alive at that point, because nuclear fuel is also not easy to come by and. Most of the nuclear power, uh, fuel that Germany has been buying has been from Russia. Uh, so here we have this kind of a system that is truly you know, relying on Russia, not only on natural gas, but also on the things that could back it up. When it comes to nuclear power, I think in, in Europe in general, France actually has not been investing in nuclear power. A lot of the issues that France has had over the last two, three years because of Russian invasion, it has with the working of its old nuclear reactors that they actually have now to reboot because they weren't building new ones to sustain them because there was this idea of uh, you know, renewable power and potentially um, natural gas supporting their system as well. Uh, the where the nuclear power could have potential impact will be places like Poland, for example, which is trying to build not one, but potentially more uh, of nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear facilities, and uh, with actually with, with, with the US. And, you know, it's right on the border with Germany, really. So I'm not sure what Germany is going to actually, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, gain uh, besides the fact that Poland will potentially be sending some of the nuclear power, hopefully once it's built, uh, to Germany. It will take time, however. Yeah. Amongst the mysteries of the universe that one should not try to explain is German nuclear policy. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it's in a large integrated market, and so look for other places that are supportive. Poland is interested in building, with U.S. support, large nuclear reactors of the kind we just finished at Vogel. That seems like it's going to go forward. There's a small SMR project that has U.S. support being um, uh, destined for Romania. Uh, and then Ukraine, to the extent that it is interconnected with Europe and, and joining the common market, is like a, can be a large source of nuclear power as well. They've got the workforce, they've got a security environment, well, they had a security environment that was, that was relatively hospitable, and so that, those are places where I think it's just more productive to look. And just to add to sentences on SMRs, yes, real technology, but the reason why we can't just simply ignore it is because China's going to build them, regardless, at scale. So the question is, is this another race that we're, willing, that we're willing to, another tech race that we're willing to lose to China if we don't step on the gas and think through a way to do this in a way where it's, it's all about how to do this cost competitively in, in a way where it's not just, you know, one-off react. Yeah, the first, the first ones are going to be complex. There's going to be setbacks. Um, we mentioned several countries that are moving forward in this, Czechia, Slovenia, and others, uh, in, even some Baltic countries. This has been a wake-up call. So even you know, when Germany is already reconsidering uh, nuclear, that, that's, that's serious. So you, it's a missed opportunity to not have a cohesive um, strategy on nuclear across Europe. It is, it is a missed opportunity. However, it will be extremely important to then once, you know, new technologies like SMRs like one or two get built, that there is a cohesive regulatory, regulatory environment that makes it easier so you don't have to go through the hoops of like certifying, you know, in multiple member states and that's, that's, go, that's going Absolutely. to Absolutely. The policy, the policy is, is usually the, not the technology, is often the, the, the issue that ends up killing some of the technologies at the end, uh, unfortunately. And actually part of the SMR is, um, is Russia also is developing mm -hmm. its own mm -hmm. SMRs yeah. and they are close. Um, in addition, most of the fuel that actually would fuel SMR would come from Russia. So there is a point of developing alternative SMR fuels uh, supply centers um, because we probably should not be in the same situation that Europe found itself uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine. Thank you. I think some of the things that I'm hearing as we're talking, there's a lot going on with 
policy recommendations with realities on the ground, geopolitical and also technological, not only innovations but complexities. Um, I'm hearing that this war of aggression is heightening an awareness of interconnectivity, not only within Europe but across Europe, and certainly drawing in the United States in terms of our ability to be part of the solution with innovation, with business possibility uh, investments, with um, uh, energy supplies. Um, but I'm hearing also that as we work forward on this nearly three years in, and certainly in 2014, after the purported invasion, uh, annexation of Crimea, we're still lacking uh, really cohesive, longer-term strategies uh, as the community writ large, um, and we're, we're still grappling very mightily with this. Um, and I think from the United States perspective, we uh, do understand and we have to understand, and I'm glad that you're here today to tell us and double down on the fact that uh, Europe whole, free, and at peace with the lights on is in the United States' best interest. And w when we can uh, have a role in um, supporting that, we, we should, and certainly um, we need clarity. And I was looking, thinking about clarity, you know, we need clarity from the national priorities, whether we're balancing, you know, comfort and cost. We need clarity from a perspective of um, how the, the business environment is working, whether it's you know, how sanctions work and, and public, pri public private partnerships and how that helps and encourage innovation and engagement. Um, I think that we have to be clear about Russia's aims. And Russia's not pulling any punches when it says that it wants to dismantle Ukraine. Um, so we have to be very clear because they're clear and they're, they're letting us know. And I think also um, it would be remiss if I didn't bring it back to the clarity of the righteousness of the Ukrainian position of self-defense and to try not to um, uh, be completely dismantled and uh, taken over by its neighbor. And it is fighting right now, not only for its existence, but also trying to um, also, again, you said partnership uh, uh, with, uh, with Europe and, and allies, and we need to, um, energy security it comes to the root of some of this geopolitical fundamental questions about um, how we live and work and, and um, exist together in a community of nations that respects rule of law and wants to do business and wants to innovate and wants to look forward to the future. So on those couple of points of clarity, I offer it perhaps back to maybe we'll go um, in reverse order. Can I offer the floor back to you for final thoughts and reflections uh, before we close today? Final point, we need to get off our back foot and be constantly on offense, you know, starting from COVID, starting from, you know, multitudes of Russians invasions, not just in Ukraine, but, uh, but Chechnya invasions and takeover of territories in Moldova, Georgia. We have been on our back foot. We have been reacting, responding to, to threats from malign players such as Russia, in cases sometimes China. We, you know, responding to global events such as COVID, which was really extremely impossible to, to predict. So we need to look ahead and ask ourselves, how do we develop a proactive strategy? And instead of letting people like Putin drive the energy security policy in Europe for the United States, for Ukraine, how do we drive a vision that we want? We have the tools, we have the capabilities, we have the innovations, we have the resources. The question is, do we have the political will? Uh, thank you for having us today. I think I'll, I'll just remind everyone that the, the sort of the transition we saw in Europe was multifaceted. I think that's just important to remember. There's things we can learn from it in terms of the speed of permitting, allowing um, both inf you know necessary infrastructure to be built really quickly, but over a long time to to reduce costs. And and the you know like it's Im it's important to remember that the U.S. now plays this sort of vital global energy security role that was super helpful in the case of Europe. Um, and we don't really know what crisis lies around the corner, but maintaining our ability to do that was clearly helpful in this case, and I think will be in the future as well. I think for me, it, the, the whole lesson from what we've went through uh, since the world has gone through, since the invasion of, uh, Russia, uh, of Russia uh, on Ukraine, uh, is that energy security is important. It's important for everybody. It's important also for Western Europe, which oftentimes before seemed to forget about it. 
uh, we've We've often been taking for granted that we can actually switch the uh, switch and the lights will go on. This is not the real reality of many people in Ukraine, but also other places in the world where it's just not enough energy for people to access. And they value any energy independent of the source in the absence of it. And I think that the fact that we are talking about energy security is important because it will help us to understand not only the, the realities of the developed world, but also the developing world, which may or break, uh, may make or break our energy transition. Uh, if there is not energy security for uh, people of India, of Southeast Asia and other places, um, Africa or so on, we will not be able to expand our transition to different fuels and to cleaner energy and so on. And maybe that's a lesson that, that the developed world can take that energy security is important, doesn't matter how well developed you are, and energy access is vital for everybody in the world. Thank you. Well, I can't think of a better note to end it on. Thank you so much for reminding us that we're in the driver's seat, we have to lead, and honestly, these issues are vital. It's been a pleasure having you here today. Thank you so much for your uh, time and testimonies, and this meeting is closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.